Our first speaker in this session is a well-known to 99% of you, uh, I hope, maybe even more, uh, but who has in a, a huge uh, reputation and consideration in this country uh, and in Australia, who's written a lot of books, been a te television producer and some of the best television done in this country, and has exposed more things and caused more ire and difficulty for himself than many. Uh, but I won't say much more because you all know John Pilcher. censorship and distortion within the media almost standard practice? <coughs> Why do great newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post deceive their readers? Why are young journalists <coughs> not taught to understand media agendas and to challenge the high claims and low purpose of fake objectivity? And why are they not taught that the essence of so much of what's called the mainstream media is not information, but power? You know, these are, I believe, urgent questions. The world is facing the real possibility of major war, perhaps nuclear war, with the United States clearly determined to isolate and provoke Russia and eventually China. This truth is being turned upside down, inside out, by journalists, including those who promoted the lies that led to the bloodbath in Iraq in 2003. Now, among those tending this conference are distinguished names with extraordinary achievements in disclosure and the analysis of data. But I wonder, have we missed perhaps the most important story? the most important issue of all, the media itself? Or is the media a mirror we prefer not to look at? The times we live in are so dangerous and so distorted in public perception that propaganda is no longer, as Edward Bernays called it, an invisible government. It is the government. It rules directly, often without fear of contradiction. And its principal aim is the conquest of us, our sense of the world, our ability to separate truth and lies from lies. The information age that we refer to, in my opinion, is principally a media age. We have war by media, censorship by media, retribution by media, demonology by media, diversion by media, a surreal assembly line of obedient cliches and false assumptions. This power to create a new reality has been building for most of my career as a journalist. 45 years ago, a book called The Greening of America caused a sensation. On the cover were the words, there is a revolution coming. It will not be like revolutions of the past. It will originate with the individual, unquote. I was a correspondent in the United States at the time and recall the overnight elevation to guru status of the author, a young <coughs> Yale academic, Charles Wright. His message was that truth-telling and political action had failed and only culture and introspection could change the world. Within a few years, driven by the forces of profit, the cult of meism had all but overwhelmed our sense 
of acting together, our sense of social justice and internationalism. Class, gender and race were separated. The personal was the political and the media was the message. In the wake of the Cold War, the fabrication <coughs> of new threats completed the political disorientation of those who 20 years earlier would have formed a vehement opposition to the kind of big brother society we've been hearing about today. In 2003, I filmed an interview in Washington with Chuck Lewis, the distinguished journalist who's taking part in this conference. We discussed the invasion of Iraq a few months earlier. I asked him, what if the freest media in the world had seriously challenged George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and investigated their claims instead of channeling what turned out to be crude propaganda? He replied that if we journalists had done our job, and I quote, there's a very, very good chance we would have not gone to war in Iraq, unquote. That's a shocking statement and one that's supported by other famous journalists to whom I put the same question. Dan Rather, formerly of CBS, gave me the same answer, more or less. David Rose of The Observer gave me pretty well the same answer. Senior journalists and producers in the BBC who wish to remain anonymous gave me the same answer. In other words, had journalists done their job, had they questioned and investigated the propaganda instead of amplifying it, hundreds of thousands of men, women and children might be alive today, and millions might not have fled their homes, the sectarian war between Sunni and Shia might not have ignited, and the infamous Islamic State might not now exist. Even now, despite the millions who took to the streets in protest, most of the public in Western countries have little idea of the sheer scale of the crime committed by our governments in Iraq. Even fewer are aware that in the 12 years before the invasion, the US and British governments set in motion what amounted to a holocaust. We denied the civilian population of Iraq a means to live. That last sentence are the words of a senior British official responsible for sanctions on Iraq in the 1990s. A medieval siege that caused the death of half a million children under the age of five, reported UNICEF. The official's name is Khan Ross. In the Foreign Office in London, he was known as Mr. Iraq. Today, he's a truth teller of how governments deceive and how journalists willingly spread the deception. We would feed journalists factoids of sanitized information, he told me, or we'd freeze them out, unquote. The main whistleblower during this terrible silent period was Dennis Halliday, the Assistant Secretary, this then Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and the senior UN official in Iraq, Halliday resigned rather than implement policies he described as genocidal. He estimates that sanctions killed more than a million Iraqis. That's before shock and awe. <coughs> what then happened to Halliday was instructed. He was airbrushed, or he was vilified. On the BBC's Newsnight program, Jeremy Paxman shouted at him, aren't you just an apologist for Saddam Hussein? The Guardian recently described this as one of Paxman's memorable moments. Last, last week, Paxman signed a million pound book deal. The handmaidens of suppression, of fake objectivity, have done their job well. Consider the effects. In 2013, a Comrades poll found that a majority of the British public believed that the casualty toll in Iraq was less than 10,000, a tiny fraction of the truth. The trail of blood that goes from Iraq to London has almost been scrubbed clean. 
Rupert Murdoch is said to be the godfather of the media mob, and no one can doubt the augmented power of his newspapers, <laughs> all 127 of them with a combined circulation of 40 million and his Fox TV <coughs> network. But the influence of Murdoch's empire is no greater than its reflection of the wider media. The most effective propaganda is often found not in Murdoch's sun or on Fox News, but beneath a liberal halo. When the New York Times published claims that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, its fake evidence was believed because it wasn't Fox News, it was the New York Times. The same is true of the Washington Post and the Guardian, both of which have played a critical role in conditioning their readers to accept a new and dangerous Cold War. All three liberal newspapers have misrepresented the events in Ukraine as a malign act by Russia, when in fact the fascist-led coup in Ukraine was the work of the United States aided by Germany and NATO. This inversion of reality is so pervasive that Washington's military encirclement and intimidation of Russia is not contentious. It's not even news. It's suppressed behind a smear and scare campaign of the kind I, I grew up with during the first Cold War. Once again, the evil empire is coming to get us, led by another Stalin, or perversely, a new Hitler. Name your demon and let rip. The suppression of the truth about Ukraine is one of the most complete news blackouts I can remember. The biggest Western military buildup in the Caucasus and Eastern Europe since World War II is blacked out. Washington's secret aid to Kiev and its neo-Nazi brigades and the integration of fascists within the Kiev government and the uh, and, and, and documented war crimes against the population of eastern Ukraine is blacked out, evidence that contradicts propaganda that Russia was responsible for the shooting down of a Malaysian airliner is blacked out. And again, supposedly liberal media are the most convincing censors, citing no facts, no evidence, one journalist identified a pro-Russian leader in Ukraine as the man who shot down the airliner. This man, he wrote, was known as the demon. He was a scary man who frightened the journalist. That was the front page evidence. <laughs> what the Russian president has to say is of no consequence. He's a pantomime villain who can be abused with impunity. An American general who is head of NATO and straight out of Dr. Strangelove, one general breed love, routinely invents Russian inventions and invasions without a shred of visual evidence. His impersonation of Stanley Kubrick's General Jack D. Ripper is almost pitch perfect. During the summer, according to General Breedlove, 40,000 Ruskies were massing on the border. That was good enough for the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Observer, the latter having previously distinguished itself with lies and fabrications that back Blair's invasion of Iraq, as its reporter, David Rose, revealed. Sometimes it feels like a class reunion. The drum beaters of the Washington Post, <coughs> uh, that is, beating the drum for isolating Russia, are the very same editorial writers who declared the existence of Saddam's we weapons of mass destruction to be, quote, hard facts, unquote. If you wonder, wrote Robert Parry, how the world could stumble into World War III, much as it did into World War I a century ago, all you need to do is look at the madness that has enveloped virtually the entire US political media structure over Ukraine, where a false narrative of white hats versus black hats 
took hold early and has proved impervious to facts or reason. Parry is, of course, the distinguished journalist who revealed Iran-Contra. He's one of the very few who investigate the role of the media in this dangerous game. But is it a game? This week, I think yesterday, the US Congress voted on Resolution 758, which in a nutshell says, let's get ready for war with Russia. In the 19th century, the writer Alexander Herzen described aggressive secular liberalism as, and I quote, the final religion, though its church is not of the other world, but of this. <coughs> Today, this divine right is unreported, yet it's far more violent and dangerous than anything the Muslim world throws up, though its greatest triumph is the illusion of free and open information. In the news, whole countries are made to disappear. Saudi Arabia, the source of Western-backed terror across the Middle East, is not a story, except when it drives down the price of oil, as it's currently doing. Yemen has endured 12 years of American drone attacks. Who knows? Who cares? In 2009, the University of the West of England published the results of a 10-year study of the BBC's coverage of Venezuela. Of 304 broadcast reports, only three mentioned any of the positive policies introduced by the government of Hugo Chavez. The greatest literacy program in human history received barely a passing reference. In Europe and the United States, millions of readers and viewers know next to nothing about the remarkable life-giving changes implemented in Latin America, many of them inspired by Chavez. Like the BBC, the reports, <coughs> yeah, the reports of Chavez's Venezuela in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian, and the rest of the Western media were routine in bad faith. Chavez was even mocked on his deathbed. How is this explained, I wonder, in schools of journalism? Why are millions of people in Britain persuaded that a collective punishment called austerity is necessary? Following the economic crash in 2008, a rotten system was exposed. For a split second, it seemed, the banks were lined up as crooks with obligations to the public they betrayed. But within a few months, apart from a few stones lobbed over at excessive bonuses, the message changed. The mugshots of guilty bankers vanished from the tabloids and something called austerity became the burden of millions of ordinary people. Was there ever a sleight of hand as brazen? Today, many of the premises of civilized life in Britain are being dismantled in order to pay back a fraudulent debt, the debt of crooks. The austerity cuts are said to be 83 billion pounds. That's almost exactly the amount of tax avoided by the same banks and by corporations like Amazon, Starbucks, and Murdoch's News UK. Moreover, the crooked banks are given an annual subsidy of 100 billion pounds in free insurance and guarantees, a figure that would fund the entire national health service. The economic crisis is pure propaganda. It's a transfer of wealth from the bottom to the top. But who's standing up for the majority? Who is telling their story? Who's keeping the record straight? <coughs> Some are, but they're few. In 1977, Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame revealed that more than 400 journalists and news executives worked for the CIA. They included journalists from the New York Times, Time, and the TV networks. In 1991, Richard Norton Taylor of The Guardian revealed 
something similar in this country, though not on the same scale. None of this is necessary today. I doubt that anyone paid the Washington Post and many other media outlets to accuse Edward Snowden of aiding terrorism. I doubt that anyone pays those who routinely smear Julian Assange, <coughs> though other rewards can be plentiful. It's clear to me that the main reason that Assange has attracted such venom, spite, and jealousy is that WikiLeaks tore down the facade of a corrupt political elite, much of it held aloft by journalism. In heralding an extraordinary era of disclosure, Assange made enemies by illuminating and ashaming <coughs> the media's gate, the, the gatekeepers within the media. He became not only a target, but a golden goose. Lucrative book and Hollywood movie deals were struck and media careers launched or kick-started on the backs of WikiLeaks and its founder. People have made big money while WikiLeaks has struggled to survive. None of this was mentioned in Stockholm this week when the editor of The Guardian and others shared with Edward Snowden the Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize. What was shocking about this event was that Assange and WikiLeaks were airbrushed. They didn't exist. They were on people. No one spoke up for the man who pioneered digital whistleblowing and handed The Guardian one of the greatest scoops in history. Moreover, it was Assange and his WikiLeaks team who effectively and brilliantly rescued Edward Snowden in Hong Kong and sped him to safety. Not a word. What made this censorship by omission so ironic and poignant and disgraceful was that the ceremony was held in the Swedish parliament, whose craven silence on the Assange case has colluded with a grotesque miscarriage of justice. It's this kind of silence we journalists need to break. We need to look in the mirror. We need not only to analyze the metadata, we need to call to account an unaccountable media that services this secret power and a psychosis that threatens world war. In the 18th century, Edmund Burke described the role of the press as that of a fourth estate checking the powerful. Was that ever true? It certainly doesn't wash anymore. What we need is a fifth estate, a journalism that monitors, deconstructs, and counters propaganda and teaches the young to be agents of people, not power. We need what the Russians used to call perestroika, an insurrection of subjugated knowledge. I would call it real journalism. <coughs> the kind, as Cy Hirsch said this morning, that scares power. It's a hundred years since the First World War. Reporters then were rewarded and knighted for their silence and collusion. At the height of the slaughter, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George confided in C.P. Scott, editor of the Manchester Guardian, I quote, if people really knew the truth, the war would be stopped tomorrow. But of course they don't know and can't know, unquote. It's time they knew. Thank you.